This is the final case of today's case call. It is in re guardianship of Versal Minors. I apologize if I mispronounced that. You can correct me. And Barbara, Barbara Versal versus Adam Versal. It's a 15 minute mini oral argument on the application. Um, Ms. Wolfram, you may attempt to reserve some of that time for rebuttal, but we ask that you keep your own time and you may begin if you are ready. Thank you, Your Honor. I will attempt to reserve three minutes. Good afternoon, Chief Justice, Associate Justices, and may it please the court. It is my honor to be here today to request that this court grant Adam Versailles application and review the lower court's rulings because this provision of the Michigan Minors Guardianship Statute is unconstitutional, both facially and as applied in this case. MCL 700.5204-2B is unconstitutional because it fails to require the court to apply a presumption in favor of a fit parent. It allows a third party to meet arbitrary standards and then infringe on a parent's fundamental right to the care and custody of their child. And it artificially pins the relevant time frame for determining this very important grant of guardianship at the time of filing regardless of where the children are at the time of the hearing. It is unconstitutional as applied in this case because the failure of the court to make any findings concerning Adam Versell's fitness as a parent nonetheless resulted in the loss of his parental authority over his daughters. In Michigan, there are three distinct ways to obtain guardianship over a minor, but we only need two. There are limited guardianships, which are done voluntarily. Although not a perfect vehicle, at least the parent is informed of the consequences of the choices they make for their child, and they're an active part of the process. There are also involuntary guardianships under the abuse and neglect portion of the probate code. Proceedings of that nature clearly invoke constitutional issues and the right to counsel attaches, and there are clear standards that protect the rights of the parent unless the children are at the substantial risk of harm. The last way is under MCL 700.5204-2B, which confers standing on any third party. If a parent permits a child to reside with another person without granting legal authority, which remains undefined. Under this statute, a parent who allows their child to live even a block away to attend a better school district can lose their rights with no consideration to the individualized circumstances in their case. The rights of a parent who work the night shift, whose children reside at a relative's home, but who remains actively involved with them on a daily basis, that parent's rights are in peril. This statute presents parents with no real choice, either voluntarily give their rights away or risk them being taken. This court should grant Adam Versell's application for leave and review MCL 700-5204-2B to resolve these clearly apparent constitutional issues and the additional issues raised in the amicus briefs filed on behalf of the Family Law um, Section and the Legal Services Association. Thank you. I'll take the court's questions at this time if there are any. Absolutely. I'll start with Justice Welch. Um, I, I thank you so much, Ms. Wolfram. Um, one of the things I'm trying to, I, I admit I'm I'm struggling on in this case is, um, and I know not, it's not directly presented to us, but um, is the timing of um, when this all happened. So at the time of the actual hearing um, in front of the judge, um, it, 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 I, I believe it's correct to say the children were with the father, correct? Yes, Your Honor. So I'm just, I, I'm, do you have any thoughts on the statute and when um, the timing needs to be measured for purposes of uh, determining when, you know, a guardianship is appropriate? Sure, Your Honor. Um, in, in my brief, I detail how um, actually uh, when this um, when this actually issue came, the Probate Judges Association supported it being pinned at the time of the filing in order that to prevent parents from being able to pick up their children after the filing. But I would suggest that that presents this constitutional issue. It should be determined at the very earliest at the time of the hearing, because in my case, especially, the children had been living with their father for more than two months at the time the court granted the full guardianship, allowing uh, Ms. Versailles to come and pick up the children from him in Texas, where he was, where he'd been living. And so it completely ignored the fact that the kids had been there that whole time. And, and that's what I mean by artificially pinning it at that time of filing. 
the court was not required to take any of the intervening events into consideration because the statute clearly says we're living with him at the time of the, or we're living with the petitioner at the time she filed the petition. And that results in, um, a, a, I think, an absurd, absurd result to remove the children from their custodial environment with their father, their fit, uh, you know, and, and um, uh, there was nothing preventing him from picking up his children at the time that he picked them up because there had been no order granted. And yet this order drew them back from where they were in Texas. So what I would agree that is a measure of unconstitutionality of the statute. Thank you. Um, Justice Zara. No questions at this time, thank you. Justice Viviano. I just wanna make sure I understand the procedural history here. The, um, the respondent didn't didn't submit any evidence at the hearing to rebut the presumption, the constitutional presumption. Is that right? Uh, the respondent was prevented from doing so. Uh, the initial proceedings in this case uh, did not have the benefit of the uh, technology that invaded our courtrooms pursuant to COVID. And uh, under the UCCJEA, he should have been allowed to provide uh, telephonic evidence. But no, he was unfortunately denied that by the trial court. Um, so he was not able to submit any evidence um, uh, officially on his behalf as far as testimony, although I would suggest that the testimony that presented that was presented um, by Barbara Versailles did not still meet the levels and in fact DHS, um, who also testified at the initial hearing, denied um, that a guardianship was appropriate in this case because the children were not under or not without care and custody because they were with their father. But no, there was no evidence presented on his behalf at the time of trial. Okay, thank you, counsel. Justice Bernstein. I have no questions, thank you. Justice Clement. No questions. Justice Kavanaugh. I have a question. Um, and, and building off a little bit of what Justice Welch talked about. Um, and I think your position is you're saying the statute is facially unconstitutional because it's the statute that pins the the determination to the time of filing rather than you know at the time that the guardianship is is actually entered or at the time of the hearing on that and and i'm wondering if that is in fact true or if whether whether it was the statute that pinned that or it's the Court of Appeals application of Deshane that says, you know, the, the relevant time period is, is when the guardianship issue arises, which actually didn't have anything to do with actually the time of the petition. And Deshane, the guardianship arose prior to the petition even being filed, at least according to the Deshane court when the, when the mother died. But looking at the language of the statute, the, and, and, to B, it says, you know, the parent or parents permit the minor to reside with another person and don't provide the legal authority. And the minor is not residing with the parents when the petition is filed. So, so I don't, I don't know that it's fair to read the statute as saying the permitting them to reside, the permission to reside and the legal authority is that, that the statute is tying that to the petition, but perhaps the court in this case and, and perhaps in, in Deshane tied it to the time of the petition. So it doesn't render the statute unconstitutional facially, but it may in fact render it, it an as applied unconstitutional, an unconstitutional application of it. Because at the time that the guardianship was entered, when the court has to determine whether these two conditions exist, it didn't. The parent, he, he clearly did not permit the children to reside with the petitioner at the time that this is being entered, regardless of whether or not he did at the time that the petition was filed. So is it that, I mean, is, isn't that a reasonable way to read the statute as saying, uh, it's not the statute that impermissibly in every case, therefore, it can never be constitutional. But in this case, it was unconstitutionally applied. 
Thank you, Your Honor. I think that the first answer is there's a lot of questions there, and that's particularly why we urge the court to adopt this, uh, to uh, accept this application, grant it, and examine these issues because you've named a number of the themes that are concerning in this factor or under this statute. So, for instance, uh, how long does a child have to reside in order for it to be determined? Um, is it even relevant? So, this court determined it wasn't relevant that my clients. Um, permission to the child to reside had expired. And that was considered irrelevant by this court because that was granted anyway. So the first answer I think is that those numbers of concerns absolutely are why this court should accept this application and explore those issues because um, it may be a um, it may be one of a number of re readings, but you would have to have all those other factors aligned in order to preserve the protection to the parents' rights. So for instance, if this court were to say, um, that there's a, another interpretation of that clause, there's still two other uh, questions that are outstanding under the statute that the court still needs to reside, re, uh, resolve. How long have the parents allowed this, or the parent allowed the child to live under the um, care of another person? What level of legal authority is even um, required? So for all of those reasons that, uh, you know, we continue to say that this statute needs to be reviewed. But particularly as to the question of just that uh, phrase of the statute of when the petition is filed, um, the court doesn't need to create uh, to um, conduct any sort of level of evidentiary hearing. And that's another element of why the statute is unconstitutional. So it's on its plain language. It says when the petition is filed. If the court makes the decision under that, it's sanctioned by this statute and can unconstitutionally invade on the parents' rights. So can I, just to follow in, in the recently, I believe last term we heard the case of Orda, right? Mm -hmm. Henry Orda, um, and where the court of appeals had, had interpreted the, the provision of permitting the minor to reside and interpreted that to mean, you know, permanently. Um, and, and the, and the, that wasn't, that condition wasn't met in that case. Right. And even under I, Justice Viviano's concurrence, from our denial of leave in that case where he says, well, I, I think he suggests that maybe it's permanent, maybe it's even indefinitely, but under that doesn't, doesn't whether it's permanent or indefinitely, your, your client at the time that this was entered, that condition wasn't met, however you want to, you know, however you want to define it. So isn't that an as applied saying that there's an error in this case in the application of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that as the courts have defined the the words in this statute that it that it could be constitutional um again i think the answer is that the statute doesn't require any type of evidentiary hearing in order to support those no testimony was required either in my case or in um you know in cases uh in, in other cases there's no evidentiary standard to say when the parent's permission expired. In this case, I think it's clear, and there's certainly arguments in our briefing that the permission expired when he picked up the child at the very early or at the very latest. Um, but in Orta, she attempted to pick up those children. In, in the Orta case, um, she had attempted to take those children out of the guardianship circumstance for over three years before she was able to roll back the clock on the invasion into her constitutional rights. So again, this is another reason why um, I think the, um, the the true answer is that there's you can't read into the statute what's simply not there. It says when the petition is filed, it says permission, and that's not clear under the statute what the courts are supposed to do with it, leading in, in to an inconsistent result for parents in this case. Um, my time has expired. I would still take the court's questions, but I would um, still try to reserve some time. Mrs. Kavanaugh, do you have additional questions? Or you... No, I'm sad. Sorry. Uh, why don't you reserve your minute and a half, Ms. Wolfram? <laughs> Mr. Sankarin. May it please the court. My name is Vivek Sankarin. I appear here on behalf of the appellee in this matter, Barbara Versell. To my knowledge, no court in this country has ever held that the Constitution permits a parent to leave a child indefinitely with a third party without granting that third party any authority whatsoever to care for children in their care. While certainly the Constitution allows parents to arrange for third parties to care for their children, with every right comes a responsibility, which is the responsibility to ensure that that third party has the ability to care for children. 
And what the guardianship statute does is fills an important void, which is that when parents place a child with third parties, but refuse or fail to provide those third parties with the power to deal with the everyday needs of children, emergencies, medical needs, um, educational needs, court can step in and protect the compelling interest of children to have that stability and permanency. Uh, and the Michigan guardianship statute does that. The statute doesn't necessarily intend for that authority to be permanent. Courts have the authority to review guardianships. Uh, and, um, and explicitly, the statute says that for a guardianship to continue more than a year, if a parent wishes for that guardianship to be terminated, the guardian bears the burden of clear and convincing evidence to show that the parent-child bond has been substantially disrupted and that continuing the guardianship is in the child's best interest. I think this case... Uh, shows why we have a guardianship statute. Um, the appellee in this matter had been caring for the children for about four years, right? Two school years and then two years um, all throughout the year for these children. And the father refused to give her any authority whatsoever to care for the children, even though she was parenting these kids in every way imaginable, right? The record reveals she was the one going to school, taking them to school, um, taking them to sports practices, so doing their homework. She was their parent. And she simply asked for something from the father so she could meet the needs of these children. The record also reveals that during these four years, there was a period of five months where she couldn't take the kids uh, to the doctor because she didn't have the legal authority to do that. Uh, record also reveals that the father kept the children's social security death benefits that they were entitled to. And without any authority to care for these children, um, there's no way that this grandmother could have gone to the social security office and claimed the money on behalf of these children. And that's not to mention the immediate risk that these children faced every day by being in a home where a caregiver didn't have the legal authority to care for them. It's the risks that we as parents know can come up unforeseen. And what the petitioner and the appellants are advancing here is a theory that really wait, uh, uh, forces the state to wait and, and wait for something bad to happen to children living in these homes. Um, and, uh, and I don't think the, the Constitution has ever required that. Um, so with that, I will, um, I will stop here and take a pause and answer any questions the court might have. Starting with Justice Welch. Great, thank you so much. Um, I guess I'm, I'm gonna sort of turn to the same thing um, that I asked Ms. Wolfram. Um, so I, I absolutely agree. There's no question, obviously, the record that um, the grandmother in this action was extremely involved in the children's lives and had them for a very long time. I, I, that, that I think is clearly um, shown by the record. Um, can a father change his mind? Uh, he was never deemed unfit. Um, you know, does a parent have a right to change their mind? And do they have a right to change their mind after the petitions filed? The response is Justice Welsh. First, I don't think the law, and this court made it clear in, in Hunter versus Hunter, this unfitness standard isn't, I don't even think the appropriate standard um, or required constitutionally in, um, in these types of cases. But secondly, even if, if this court holds that the unfitness standard does apply, this is the same standard of proper care in the abuse and neglect context as well. That the abuse, the juvenile code specifically states that improper care is um, that, that a care is only a, pr a proper as defined in the statute if a parent arranges for someone legally responsible to care for the child. And so the guardianship statute, it just mirrors the definition of, of proper care in the juvenile code. Um, all we're asking, the, the question of changing his mind, you know, the father, a, a power of attorney that would have empowered this grandmother to care for the child is always revocable, right? This was a choice the father had made for these four years not to give uh, what these children needed in terms of adequate care. Um, and certainly he could have filed a motion to terminate the guardianship at, at any point. But I think at some point when kids are permanently residing, this is why that word, that the Orta case and the discussion we had there about what the word reside, these are not short-term arrangements we're talking about. This is a question of a number of years that these children had, had been living there and I think in these type of long-term arrangements, the needs of children to have their everyday needs uh, be, be met um, starts to rise. And the state certainly has a compelling interest in these long-term arrangements to make sure that the needs of kids are, are met. And I think that's what the trial court tried to do here. I understand the questions procedurally. It was, a, it was a complicated case. And I think the trial court wanted to get additional information about the father and the father just didn't, didn't participate in the court process. He made a choice not to do so. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Sankar, why, why is, why did the court um, correctly, um, why, why was the court correctly meeting the standard that the statute requires? And the court found that not only did dad not intend for the kids to permanently reside with his mom, he intended the opposite. So why, I don't understand why the statutory basis was met for guardianship in this case. There was no evidence in the record, Your Honor, that, that, uh, that the father intended for this to be a temporary arrangement. I mean, there was no, the only witness that testified here was the grandmother who said that she had no knowledge whatsoever from the, from the father about what his, his, his intentions were. I mean, it's, after the filing of the petition, he came and took the children but that's what I'm talking about, because when that, I, I mean, I, I know the statute doesn't doesn't say, but I know that, and I guess in Duchesne, the Court of Appeals has said that relevant time period is when the guardianship arises. I, I, it seems to me that the guardianship arises when a court orders a guardianship. So when the guardianship arose at the hearing, it was very clear that dad did not intend for the kids to live with his mom. So it just feels to me like there's just an element missing in the statute. It may also be unconstitutional as applied to him, someone who has his kids in his possession, someone who uh, about whom there is no allegation that um, he has done anything at that time, at the time the guardianship arises to, to put the kids in any danger. Um, but it feels to me like there's an easier answer here, which is the court found the opposite of what the statute says. Is that not right? Well, I think the statute says in, uh, that, that the, the time at which this is measured is when the petition is filed, or at least that's how I read the statute. And that's also, I think, consistent with how other child custody sort of rearing statutes, um, that's when the time is measured. So for example, juvenile code, right? Case law is it's at the time, the circumstances at the time the petition is filed, even though the trial is might be several months later. And so but that's different. That's because the state is making an allegation about um, a, a, a child that has happened at that moment. This is a private party coming to court. We don't have any support from the state saying that this parent has done anything that um, means we should interfere with his parental rights. We have just a private party who files a guardianship when she decides to file it. Um, so when the court is actually deciding the questions, if one of the elements is missing, why, why isn't that the end of this particular case? We, I, I agree there are some big issues looming out there for parents who um, still, you know, at the time the hearing happens, their kids are with them and there are no allegations against them. I think there are some constitutional questions and we're going to probably appoint you to, to argue that the other way next time because this is fun for us. <laughs> but why in this case don't we just have a simple, the statute's not supported? Well, you're right. I, I do think there were allegations that the guardianship made, uh, that the guardian made at the time of, of filing, which was that for several years, this father had provided inadequate care for his children by placing them with her without any legal authority whatsoever. And the statute says that the time to measure that is the time of the petition's filing. I think practically, if this court rules that the only time period that is relevant is the time of the hearing, it creates incredibly powerful incentives for, for parents, as, as, soon as you know, practically speaking, you know, our, our clinic handles guardianship cases all the time. Um, we file a guardianship and, it, and there's a time be, be, between the hearing and the filing of the petition. And it, what we'd be saying to parents is go take your kids out of homes where kids have been living for lengthy periods of time between the time of filing and the time of the hearing. And then a guardianship. And if, can and never if we be appointed you to represent a parent who did that, you would come tell us that that's absolutely their right to do. Right? They're the parents. They get. I to don't do think that. so. I, you know, you're, well, maybe I would. I, I can't. I can't predict what I would be arguing in, in a hypothetical case. But I, I think certainly a trial court should consider up to date information. The question is like it, it is, it, and and certainly that's what happens in other contexts, in the abuse and neglect context, for example. We. Right that information between the time of filing and the time of hearing. But to say that a trial court is jurisdictionally barred from entering an order simply because the parent has has um, uh, has what gone up and, and picked up a child would really be a powerful uh, it would be a, I mean, it, it would be a powerful set of incentives where it doesn't matter how long a child has been living with that. You know, we have some cases, eight, nine, 10 years, a kid has been living with a guardian or not, not even a guardian, a relative who wants a guardianship. And what this court would then be saying is you can go and get your kid unless somehow the guardian figures out a way to get an ex parte, immediate, temporary, and, and there's no real mechanism or more, most courts don't operate like that. There's no race to the courthouse like that. 
And so that's my big worry about, about this is that we have many people caring for children on a long-term basis that if we hold that it's at the time of the hearing, um, then um, I, I guess in my mind, there's a distinction between can, can a court uh, grant it versus should a court consider up-to-date information at the time of the hearing to make the best judgment possible? Yeah, I just read the statutory language to require that the kids be living with the guardian, the, 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 the proposed guardian at the time it's filed and not so for, for the other two requirements. But I'm, I'm hogging all the time, so I'm going to move on to other, other um, questions, Justice Zara. Um, no questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Sankar. Justice Viviano. I have no questions. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Bernstein. Counsel, just a, a, a few quick questions. What is it that you're concerned about? If the court were, you know, to, to rule against you, I just am always curious, what is the ramifications of that? I think the ramifications is that we have probably thousands of children in the state living with relatives who would then not have the ability to get any legal authority for kids living in their care uh, without relying on child protective services because they would no longer have this private mechanism to go to a guardianship court and get authority to meet the everyday needs of children. So what I worry most about a case, this case is we will leave these caregivers without any mechanism or recourse to go get authority in cases where parents have chosen to have those children live with those relatives, but have refused or failed to provide those relatives with legal authority. Thank you, Counsel. Justice Clement. Okay, so um, just to follow up on, on the Chief Justice and, and Justice Bernstein, what I think I hear you saying, and I just wanna make sure that, that I'm clear here, is that if we were to overrule the Court of Appeals, we're possibly putting in, in place um, a situation where once a petition is filed, parents can come take their children out of you know, a stable environment that they may have been in for long periods of time. In order to avoid that, the option that they have is to give power of attorney to um, wh whoever the child is, is residing with. If they were to do that, um, then that individual wouldn't be able to file a petition for guardianship because they would have the legal authority that they need. That's correct, right? Okay, um, so then on the flip side of it, if we were to do this, is the only recourse that that individual has, let's say they've had a child with them for, for five years, is knowing that this is possible, that if they file the petition, that the parent can then come pick up the children, um, does that leave them with the recourse of, of getting CPS involved and saying that the child has, you know, trying to, uh, you know, present a case of child's been with me for X period of time, you know, the, the, you know, the limitation or the, you know, the parents have limited interaction with them, whatever the, that scenario is. And now all of a sudden we're heading towards termination of, of parental rights in those cases. I think that's, that's probably the realistic recourse that, that, that relatives would have. It's certainly what I would advise my clients if they if, if the time, you know, in, the, in that small window between when a parent picks up the child and, and when the petition is filed, if they get any wind that this is going to happen, or to rush to court to get a, some sort of emergency order. Um, and so, you know, the, the, because, because if this court holds that the second that parent gets the child, regardless of the circumstances uh, and how long, that, that the probate court would then lose the authority to order a guardianship. Um, I think that, that it, would, it would create, I think, certain pressures within CPS. They'd have to, to handle a lot more of these cases. Okay. And then my other, my other question is, when you're, when you're looking at the statute, because um, I think this is kind of what, what um, we're, we're going back and forth on, is the, the, the timing of when the petition is filed, do you see that um, relating only to uh, where the, the minor is not residing with their, his or her parents? or to all three pieces um, in subsection B? Yeah, I have always read that, that phrase to apply to all three pieces of subsection B and not just to the where the child was, uh, was residing. Okay, and is that because if we read it where it only applies to the, the residing portion of that, then that would also open that, that door for game, gamesmanship of, and, and I guess, the question what we would have to, or the trial courts would have to look at is, you know, after um, 
you know, after that period, after the petition is filed, the parent can change their mind on whether or not they want to permit the minor to reside with another person, or they could immediately just draw up, you know, a power of attorney um, to give to give that individual legal authority to kind of circumvent this entire thing. Is that is that why you is that is that that's, does that make that's sense? Correct, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Justice Kavanaugh. Not to belabor this, but I'm going to a little bit. So, so do you read DeShane as being as 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 being consistent with what you're saying? Is that the time the as as the DeShane court put it, the guardianship of issue arises is the relevant time period. Um, it's not when the petition is filed because this was. At the time in DeShane, when they said the guardianship couldn't enter, the child was in fact with the petitioner at the time the petition was filed. The child was with the petitioner at the time of the hearing when the guardianship issue, when, when it issued. Um, and the Court of Appeals said, no, that's not right because it arose actually prior to the petition even being filed. Um, I guess maybe, and maybe that's the question, is this, is this statute, like, is there more work that we need perhaps from the parties to figure out what is the, the right timing from the language of the statute um, and perhaps in light of how it's actually applied or, or what makes sense um, as we've now beat to death this question of, you know, this window between filing and the actual hearing, which isn't, isn't that long, but it, it is long enough to submit a signed um, power of attorney or to go up and get your kids or whatever. Um, so I guess I, I guess I would like to see what you think about that. Do you think that there's more that we need to, is it reasonable to say that we need to look at that a little bit more about the timing issue from the statute? But you're, I think there's two different questions. And I think the one that me and, and Ms. Wolfrand could probably agree on is that there are certainly areas of clarity that, that need to happen with the guardianship statute, right? I think that in terms of this timing question, I think that there are, there are phrases in the statute and, and ambiguity that, um, that clarity would help everybody involved in the, in the system. Um, the question about whether like, the constitutionality of it, in my mind, is a separate question, right? And in my mind, you know, the, the, the narrow issue raised by Ms. Wolfram was really that this provision is unconstitutional. And, and that's where I think um, it would be a, 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 an extension of any decision that I've ever seen about sort of the parameters of constitutional rights that would hold that a parent who leaves children in these types of arrangements um, is, is within their constitutional right to, to do so. Um, I've always read the guardian, that, that, that provision B about talking about the, the, the time of filing, but I can see that there's some ambiguity within the case law as well about whether it's filing, whether it arose, and so some clarity around that, I think, would be would be helpful. Um, again, just to repeat my the concerns I voiced to Justice McCormick, though, I just worry about if the only operative time frame is the time of the hearing, it it really does provide powerful um, and and destabilizing incentives to litigants to game the system to um, to undermine the authority of courts to be able to grant this. And I don't think that um, is a good thing for for children. And as I said to Justice Clement. Um, I, I worry that that would then increase phone calls to CPS because of worried families. And, and I don't think we want that as a system. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sankarin. Ms. Thank you, Your Wilson, Honor. You have a minute and 21 seconds. Thank you, just very briefly. Uh, Your Honors, the constitution requires due process and this statute doesn't afford it. So as to the narrow question of whether this statute is constitutional, the answer is no, because it fails to afford due process to the parents. A second and related point is that limited guardianships are always an option. They can always request from the parent to voluntarily give up that, uh, delegate their parental authority. And in these cases, I ask this court to remember that there is no implication that these parents are unfit. And so when we talk about the terrible danger of a parent picking up their children, the answer is that what is the danger in a fit parent picking up their children? The decision to make to allow that child to live with a third party is presumed to be a fit decision in the best interest of their child. Um, lastly, the power of attorney is not enough. Counsel, what do you say? Counsel, what do you say in this case, though, 
where, you know, I mean, from what Brother Council was saying, where they weren't able to get medical care and they weren't able to do these basic things because technically they had no authority to do so. How do we work with that? Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, there are two answers to that. First, as to the record, it would reflect that Ms. Versailles did testify she was able to accomplish all of the required care for the kids and that she thought she might not be able to achieve care in the future, but that the children did in fact receive all their care. And I would refer this court to under MCL 712A.2, which says the court cannot take jurisdiction over a case in an abuse neglect situation if the children do in fact receive that adequate care. So in this case, they did receive adequate care. And if this case had been brought under 712A.2, the court would not have been able to take jurisdiction. And the second answer is, um, she no longer needed any of that authority. So the point is, if it was the case that the kids were still living with her at the time or not achieving the needs that she that were needed to be met, she could have met the standards under an abuse and neglect or shown unfitness of Mr. Versailles for failing to provide those things for the children. But that's not the case. She, there was nothing that needed to be done for these children by Barbara Versailles because they were living with their father at the time who was a fit parent and it was his responsibility to provide the medical care going forward. I see. So, thank you, Council. Thank you. Um, essentially, my time is concluded and in brief um, summation, uh, if the parent is not providing care, then the, then the petitioner should be required to prove it. And under the statute, they're not. And so we ask this court to accept this application in order to clarify these issues. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both. The case will be submitted and that concludes today's case call. We'll be back here tomorrow morning at 930.